Good evening from our headquarters in Kiev. This is This Sunday Show, Dramatic International, the only prime time English program explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm Natalia Humanyuk. It's one week till the snap elections in Ukraine, so during this show, we'll definitely discuss that. Uh, what to expect uh, during this pretty important summer week. Uh, but the story we are starting the program uh, is devoted to quite a controversial decision of the Italian court to sentence to 24 years a Ukrainian soldier, a former soldier of Ukraine's National Guard, Vitaly Markiv, uh, who had been accused of involvement in the murder of the Italian photographer Andrea Rocelli in the Donbas in 2014. Uh, the decision was announced by the court without reasoning and uh, there were quite a lot uh, discussion about this very, very harsh uh, sentence. And I have my colleague, Olga Takaryuk, uh, who is now in studio. And uh, Olga has just come back from Pavia, uh, the province where the court taking place. So probably you would explain first, be before we watch your story, what is so special about it? Yeah, I've been following actually this case uh, since uh, 2017 when Vitaly Marchi was arrested in Italy uh, in the summer uh, on the grounds actually of... Uh, uh, first he was accused of being a murderer, of uh, directly murdering uh, a photographer Andrea Rochelli and his translator, a Russian citizen Andrei Mironov. And uh, later the um, accusation was transformed into assisting in murder. And this is uh, the accusation that in the end he was found guilty of. So uh, a trial, this trial, it went on for a year. And actually what I would say is the most striking thing is that nobody expected such a harsh verdict. Till the very end it was unclear whether actually Markiv will be found guilty because there were so many doubts in this trial. There was no really hard proof. It was the process mostly based on opinions. So I would say that uh, the majority of the public in the court, because it, the hearing was open to the public, was really shocked uh, when they heard that Markiv was sentenced to 24 years uh, of imprisonment. I probably would uh, remind uh, to our audience that before, the, we, before we watch the report <coughs> that uh, we're speaking about the period of May 2014. Uh, there were two people uh, killed, Andrea Rochelli, an Italian journalist, and as well Andrei Mironov, a Russian a human rights activist who was translating. And that was a moment where there was all the time shelling near the city of Slavyansk between the Ukrainian troops and the separatists, Russian-backed separatists. So there was a territory where journalists usually didn't go. That was the first case of uh, the death of the journalists during the uh, war uh, in the east of Ukraine. Uh, but we kind of remember that there was a moment where nobody could really get uh, to the place without uh, risking a life. Uh, but I suggest we watch uh, the report, uh, Olga's report from Italy. Twenty-four years of imprisonment. The court in the Italian city of Pavia recognized former Ukrainian soldier Vitaly Markiv guilty of murdering an Italian photographer Andrea Rochelli in the Donbass in 2014. After a six-hour meeting, the jury passed a sentence that exceeded the one previously asked by the Italian prosecutor. He demanded the Ukrainian be sentenced to 17 years in prison. But the judges decided not to take into account the mitigating circumstances. For example, the fact that Markiv had not previously been tried. In the name of the Italian people, the court of Assisi in Pavia, having regarded to articles 553 and 555 of the criminal code, recognizes Vitaly Markiv guilty of the crimes he was charged with and sentenced him to 24 years in prison. This decision shocked more than a hundred of the Ukrainians present at the court, who came from all over Italy to support Markiv. But first and foremost, it shocked Markiv's mother. She has been living in Italy for many years with her husband, an Italian. Since he was a teenager, Vitaly Markiv lived here too, with his Italian citizenship. When the Euromaidan protests started in Kiev, 
Markiv returned to Ukraine, and in 2014 he went to defend the Donbas from Russia-backed separatists. Pavia showed us how courts function here, but it's okay, we will show that there are other and more honest judges. We will withstand this together with him. At the same time, the parents of the deceased in the Donbas, photographer Rokeli, say that they are not happy that they condemned this man, but consider the sentence a triumph for justice. These sentiments are echoed by the president of the Association of Journalists of the Lombardy region, who is on the plaintiff side. According to the court decision, the site will receive monetary compensation from the state of Ukraine in the amount of 5,000 euros. The court established the verdict on the basis of the evidence provided. It doesn't matter whether we are talking about one euro or one million euros. The main thing is that the court protected the rights of journalists, those who work with sensitive information. Markiv's attorney, Raffaele de la Valle, in turn calls the sentence absurd and will appeal it. He believes that the evidence of Markiv's involvement in the death of journalists was not sufficiently provided in court and the position of judges lacked balance. During the trial, the defense claimed there is no evidence that it was the Ukrainian army that were firing and offered to conduct investigative actions in the Donbas. But the prosecutors rejected this proposal and built a case based on the testimony of witnesses and data from Google Maps. And this turned out to be convincing enough for the judges. I have not seen such a crazy sentence in my 56 years as a lawyer. Never. I am not interested in motivation because it is impossible to motivate a conviction in such circumstances. It's just a shame. Vitaly Marchi was arrested at the Bologna airport in 2017. The court hearings lasted for about a year. He was accused of being a soldier of the National Guard in 2014, informing the Ukrainian military of the location of the journalists. The military then, according to the Italian case, fired mortars. As a result, the photographer Rokelli and his Russian translator Andrei Mironov died. This happened on the territory controlled by Russia-backed separatists. The French journalist William Rogelon managed to survive and he was the main witness in the case. Markiv himself claimed that he was at the moment two kilometers from the site of the deaths of Rokelli and Mironov and learned about it from a conversation with Italian journalists. An article in the Corriere della Sera newspaper, as it turned out in the court, full of errors and inaccuracies, was the reason for the arrest of this Ukrainian. A few hours after the announcement of the verdict, under the Italian embassy in Kiev, about 300 people arranged a rally demanding the release of Vitaly Markiv. I also suggest you read the story on uh, Vitaly Markiv on our webpage eon.hromatsky.ua to know more details. Um, and we're coming back to the uh, discussion. So that's quite an unusual case of the soldier uh, being accused of a deliberate murder. Uh, and uh, can you explain what was the evidence? Uh, because uh, everybody who'd been there and like who followed the conflict know that there was just a shelling. And of course, Marky was one of the many Ukrainian soldiers which been just on that hill from where shelling was taking place. Yeah, exactly. Well, actually, the first thing to start with is we don't know from where the shelling was coming in. The prosecutors insisted it was the Ukrainian army who shelled the journalists, but there is no hard proof of that. They based this claim on the uh, evidence, on the testimony of the only survivor in that attack, the French uh, photographer William Rogelon, who, when he was first uh, um, when he was first given his testimony to the French court in 2014, immediately after these events, he said he wasn't sure who was shelling, but he thought maybe it was Ukrainian army, but I'm not sure. On the other hand, when he was uh, questioned by the Italian uh, investigation in 2017, he said, I'm sure it was the Ukrainian army. And when he was asked, did you ever seen any uh, Ukrainian soldier? He said, no. So what is your... Uh, uh, what is your this being sure is based on? He said, "Well, that's because after I went out after the shelling, I uh, met separatists. So probably it wasn't them who shelled. Probably it was the Ukrainians who were shooting." So you see how this is more his opinion than really hard proof. Then another thing that what we are talking about, okay, first we don't know who was really uh, shooting at the journalists. Uh, Ukrainian soldiers were based on this hill Karachun, as you mentioned, and Vitaly Markiv was just one of more than 100 Ukrainian soldiers stationed there. 
He was not a captain of the army, as he was described in the article, which uh, was a pretext of his arrest. So basically, this whole process started from the, the article by the Italian journalist, uh, freelance journalist uh, Ilaria Morani, who wrote an article for uh, the newspaper Corriere della Sera, in which basically he wrote that the captain of the Ukrainian army, he didn't in, uh, put his name in, but the investigators uh, un understood later it was Vitaly Markiv. She said, the captain of the Ukrainian army confesses in murder of the, of the, of the journalist. But there is no this recording of this conversation. His, Markiv says he never confessed. He just found out of the murder of the journalist from this conversation with, the, with, this, uh, with Ilaria Morani. And uh, uh, it was established later that there were numerous errors in, in this article, that Markiv wasn't a captain, he was a, just a normal soldier. And uh, So was there any real investigation on the Italian side? Were the people, investigators, coming to Karachun, to Slavyansk? It's a freed territory now. You know, we're just remembering next week the case of the um, five years since the uh, downing of the MH17 jet. Uh, there is no real verdict. So far, so there is so much hardcore evidence, uh, but there is this kind of very complex international investigative team. There was no investigation on the ground, that's true. Well, uh, first, that's uh, Italian side. Uh, you see that Marky was arrested in 2017 and the investigation started a few years, uh, uh, maybe a year earlier. The Italian say, side insists that the Ukrainian side, side failed to do investigation immediately after these events. Uh, um, Rokelli was murdered, or well, he died um, near Slavyansk when it was the separatist controlled territory in May 2014. That territory, for a couple of months more, was still in the hands of separatists. Ukrainian uh, state only regained control over this territory a couple of months later after the death of Rokelli. So the I Italians say that Ukraine state failed to do the investigation that's why they had to do their own investigation but it is actually weird why the Italian investigators decided they wouldn't go to see the location of the events they only based the case on the Google Maps on uh, evidence from the internet and on testimonies and Ukraine after the arrest of Markiv Ukraine offered Italy to create a joint investigative team to uh, uh, investigate this, uh, the deaths of Andrea Rokelli and Andrei Mironov, but Italy never accepted that request. And um, how can you describe the court itself? Well, you talk to the lawyer, you talk to advocate, you talk to a prosecutor. Yes. That's quite a harsh sentence, so please explain why it's so harsh, because the pros prosecutor wanted 17 years, and now it's even like 24. Yeah, exactly. Well, the uh, Vitali Markiv's attorney, Raffaele Della Valle, who is one of the best uh, lawyers in Italy, uh, he said that uh, he's really shocked that uh, there were no mitigating circumstances considered because he said that basically everyone, even the mafiosi, get mitigating circumstances. And that's uh, also we should consider that Vitali Markiv has been already imprisoned for two years. So since he was arrested, he was not under house arrest. He was refused house, house arrest. So he was for one year in waiting for the trial, and then during the trial, another year, he, he already spent two years in prison. So, uh, not, but not only uh, Vitaly Markov's lawyer was surprised by such a hard sentence, even the prosecutor Andrea Zanoncelli, whom I talked to, said he was surprised because he said, I don't know what was the reason uh, by judges, by the jury. We should consider that, that a decision was, were, was taken by the jury for this harsh sentence, but probably the, uh, our evidence was very convincing for them. We will know the details why the, the court decided so in 90 days. The, the judges have 90 days to release the, motivating, the motivations of this verdict. So uh, let us know what's happening uh, with the case now, uh, what to expect next besides what you've just mentioned, and also how about the, all the discussion, there is a discussion about some kind of political reasoning uh, behind this decision, because it's quite rare globally that there is the conflict, there is a shelling, and there is one soldier who is singled out and is accused of murdering somebody in the war zone. 
it's really quite an unusual situation. It's an unprecedented situation, and this is uh, uh, this was stressed also by the lawyer of uh, Markiv, who said that if the soldier was American or he was English, it would have never happened. So basically, what the lawyer was hinting at, he, he, it was he was hinting that this process is political. Well, there was a huge pressure uh, in the Italian media. Uh, to found, as they framed it, uh, a guilty, uh, uh, a murderer, and uh, uh, in in this case, and the justice in in Andrea Rocchelli's case. Of course, it is a very sensitive case because uh, a journalist was has died. So there was a big pressure from the Association of Journalists, from the Italian Federation of Journalists, who were also a part of this, on the, the plaintiffs, they were plaintiffs in this case, they uh, filed a complaint against the Ukrainian state. So now not only Vitaly Markiv was found guilty in this case, but also the Ukrainian state, they will not, that will now have to pay a compensation. Um, but there, there is also the, this political side that, the, the, well, of course, we don't have any like hard proof of that. But the political situation, current political situation in Italy, is that now uh, in the government there is a, a Lega party uh, with uh, Matteo Salvini as his head, and it is interesting that almost at the same time with this verdict, one day before, uh, in the um, on the BuzzFeed news website, there were published the recordings of the conversation between the Matteo Salvini's closest aide with some uh, Russian businessman. Basically, the, the, the talk was about Russian money being given to Lega Party to fund its uh, European elections campaign. Of course, now Salvini denies that uh, Lega has ever taken money from the Kremlin, but we know that Lega Party is quite pro-Russian, that Matteo Salvini supports lifting uh, EU sanctions against Russia, and so on and so forth. So maybe, well, as I say, again, we don't have any like proof and evidence, but uh, in s the, cr the climate, the political climate in Italy is such that it doesn't favor, let's say, it favors Russia and it doesn't favor Ukrainian citizens. So, Olga, thanks a lot, and I understand you will follow the, po the, the story. There is an appeal, uh, but uh, we also, uh, sh I've had a chance shortly to talk to Paul Gogo, who is a French journalist, but who's been together with uh, one of the key witnesses and the person who survived uh, the French, uh, another French journalist who has been um, acquainted to him and was during uh, the, the day before tragedy was together. So uh, Paul Gogo is saying on what were the circumstances for the journalist at that moment to work near Slavyansk and whether there were we can at all think about any kind of deliberate murder. <laughs> Paul, thanks for joining us. We are discussing now the case of the uh, Ukrainian National Guard soldier Vitaly Markiv and in particular the accusation of him uh, of murder of the Italian journalist and the Russian uh, translator uh, in Slavyansk. Uh, but what we know from this story is that uh, the, the court case that the uh, testimony of the witness uh, of the um, of, of the prosecutor was mainly based off the talks of the local Italian freelancers and in particular French journalist William Ragillon. Uh, you've been working in uh, Slavyansk as well in uh, early uh, in spring, uh, May 2014. Can you describe what were the conditions of the journalists there in particularly around the time that this tragedy had happened? Uh, yes, first, uh, I think uh, we have to understand that we were a lot of freelancers, like uh, I was, like William Rockland was, like freelancers that decided to come in uh, Donbass to, to, to try to begin to work, to send uh, our pictures, our stories. And uh, most of these freelancers were living in a hostel uh, that was located in center Donetsk. And uh, William was one of them. I lived with William uh, for three or four days in uh, Donetsk. Uh, he came to uh, live with us. And we, uh, from the beginning, we understood that uh, it was kind of first experience. He already worked in Syria before, but uh, he, he was like a lot of freelancers, like a bit lost. Uh, he couldn't understand what was happening. Uh, even ask us something like who are the bad, who are the good. So we had to explain him uh, where who, uh, who the separatists, uh, where was the Ukrainian army, and we had to explain him what was happening in Slavians. 
And uh, you have to know that at this time, we all understood that in Slavyansk, uh, the shelling were terrible, the war was uh, going on, and we all decided to stay in Donetsk just for security reasons, because we were freelancers. We had no money to organize this kind of uh, report uh, inside the shelling, and in some ways it was totally useless to go under the shelling. So, um, to tell you all the story, uh, the morning this catastrophe happened, uh, William asked us if we wanted to go with the, him, with them, uh, in Slavyansk, because uh, he worked for three or four days in uh, Donetsk. He told us he was bored by that, because uh, uh, the war were, was concentrated in uh, the Slavyansk. And, uh, and so he decided to go there. Uh, he asked us if we wanted to go with him, and we said, no, it's too dangerous. Uh, I remember his last word to me were uh, something like, I'm going to call you uh, if I need help or if something happened. I told him, I don't really know you. Call me if you want. Uh, and then the day happened, and uh, William called me during the day, and he was totally in panic. The shelling was going on. He told me, they are all dead. I don't know if they are dead. Uh, I don't know if the Italian guy is dead. I couldn't save him. I've tried to calm him. I've asked him, tell me where you are, who were the guys with you, uh, what is happening now, uh, do you have a solution to, to leave the place? Uh, he was totally in panic. I just understood that he was with a Russian man and an Italian man. Uh, he, he didn't tell me about Ukraine or separatist shelling. He just didn't know what happened uh, because he didn't know where uh, he was. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I called the embassy, uh, Italian and French embassy, to tell them that something was happening. And then uh, he came to hospital and we learned then that the Italian photographer uh, dead, died. So, Paul, uh, the case uh, of uh, Ukrainian soldier Vitaly Markov is based on the um, idea, this accusation, that that was a deliberate murder, that it was not a collateral damage which happens during the time of the crossfire. Uh, we remember that uh, time. Not everybody remembers, but I also remember how it was there at the area. Uh, but that was done in particular by a particular man in order to kill the witnesses, the journalists who were showing something. Uh, to what extent, I understand it's quite theoretic, but just knowing so, so well what was going on there in Slavyansk, meaning like this shelling, uh, how can you also describe the nature of, uh, of the events and of the shelling? To what extent you can, uh, we can consider about any kind of a deliberate murder of journalists? Uh, actually, when I saw uh, what the Italian tribunal said, I was a bit surprised because uh, we all remember that at this time the shelling were strong, uh, the fights were really strong, and uh, we couldn't even imagine to go there to inside this shelling to see wh what happened. And I even think uh, Ukrainian army and the separatist side, uh, I think we don't it was such a mess at this time that the position were moving uh, during the day. And uh, I think sometimes even Ukrainian army or separatist soldiers, they did not really knew where they, where was the front line because there were no front line at this time, actually. And, and so it was a really big mess. And I was really surprised to see what the Ital Italian uh, justice said because uh, I can't imagined that someone decided to kill like this journalist like that because I remember at this time when I was in Ukrainian side or in the separatist side the priority for Ukrainian and separatist was to protect the journalist because they didn't want to kill a journalist because we knew after they will have a lot of government a lot of pressure a lot of problems uh, trying to to call them and to control them. So everyone was really careful with journalists. The things that I, I don't know about this Italian photographer, but I, I know William came there without knowing where he was going. 
and I remember they had a car, like an old car, uh, where nothing was written. They were not uh, identified like journalists. And uh, you just go with this car in the middle of the fight. And at this time, you know, the separatists were traveling in cars and trucks in the middle of Slavyansk. Uh, like uh, it was not written separatists or, or fighters on their car. So Ukrainian army was fighting against them. And I guess they just couldn't know who was in this car. And uh, I, I don't really understand if there is a, a sense to try to understand uh, if uh, it was normal or not that the Ukrainian army dis decided to shell at this time or not, because it was just really big mess and everyone was fighting at this time. And uh, Paul, what we also understand that there was no, uh, from the Italian side, any kind of uh, idea of the independent investigations and uh, there were some suggestions. So the, do you know anything about like the people like you who were there on the side, who were witnesses of the, uh, the way the journalists were working in Slavyansk exactly during the day? Were they ever uh, questions? Were you ever approached by the Italian investigations uh, to give any kind of evidence to make the case more clear? Uh, no, um, actually I was maybe a bit surprised because I, I don't know at all about the Italian. I never met this photographer. I don't know if he made mistakes or not, but I know that he's French. And I also know all the French embassy uh, organized uh, his uh, kind of escape from Donbass after I follow everything. And uh, I know this French came back to France and came to police to ask them to investigate. And at this time, back at this time, French police called some of my colleagues that participated uh, to, uh, to the, the escape from Donbass. Uh, but I also remember police, French police told them that uh, they were not expecting to make a real investigation because it was a war zone and they just couldn't uh, find someone guilty into a war zone. Uh, but that's all what I know. But from Italian side, uh, none of my colleagues have been uh, called or, yes, have been asking questions on this topic. So, Paul, thanks a lot for talking to us. Uh, we hope that this information would uh, also uh, be publicized and would be picked up because we are staying on the case. Thank you. Thank you. And in order for Hrvatsk International exist and toll, tell you these stories, uh, we encourage you to support our projects. Uh, so you can come to our webpage en.hrvatsk.ua and donate and support uh, Hrvatsk International. So even the smallest donation will help our team work. We're working with quite a small resources. Uh, so you have unbiased and objective information from Ukraine and the region. Uh, and there is another story in which you definitely need to have unbiased biased and objective information. Uh, these are the snap elections happening now in Ukraine and I have the panel to uh, discuss uh, what we're expecting next week. So we have uh, Serhii Korsunsky who is the director of Ukrainian Diplomatic Academy, a Ukrainian diplomat and Paul Nyland who is the founder of the Life T Lifeline Ukraine and also a long-time Ukraine watcher. Um, so thanks for coming with us. Uh, I should probably uh, remind about the uh, polls we have at this stage. So the uh, company rating, we can trust the sociological group, on July 6, uh, July 10, uh, had made the poll. And according to it, we should mention um, the servant of the people, President Zelensky party has 47%. Opposition platform uh, for life uh, with a... Uh, 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 quite a pro-Russian views has 11.6 percent. European solidarity by former President Poroshenko 8.2, and the Holos a voice party by the rock star Vakarchuk 6.6 percent, but Kivchina by Yulia Tymoshenko. Uh, 
6.4%, and uh, we should mention that uh, that was done among those who will vote and uh, di decided on their choice. Uh, 2,000 respondents were asked with a margin of error no more than 2.2%. Uh, um, so, if to explain uh, to our foreign audience, uh, maybe you would start, uh, Serhii, what are the most important to know about these elections and what to expect? The polls are quite uh, similar, they're changing a bit, but uh, every week we are announcing them. Where to, what to look at? Uh, uh, let's uh, uh, consider those elections and, uh, as a uh, uh, precondition of the forming of the future government. So from this point of view, the most important issue, whether uh, the Zelensky uh, team, Zelensky party will be able to get uh, the majority to form a single party government for the first time in our history. Uh, it looks like they're doing pretty well, 47%, uh, but uh, if uh, that would be the case, they will need definitely one or two partners mm -hmm. to form the coalition, to form the government. That's uh, the key point because uh, then we can easily predict that uh, leaders of those future members of coalition will demand the prime minister post or senior positions in the government. That will be uh, interesting uh, to see how this new team of uh, younger generation of Ukrainian politicians coming with uh, Zelensky party will be working with older guard, if it's Batkivshina, for example, or uh, Poroshenko. See, that's, that's actually where, where I see the trap that's coming up for, for Zelensky. I don't think that he will pass 50%. I, I don't think that he will have a, a, a clear majority by himself. He's going to have to form a coalition. But, but then who can he make a coalition with? He certainly won't be able to do that with European Solidarity, which was the bloc of Petro Poroshenko and is now renamed. He, if, if he were to do it with somebody like Medvedchuk or with Boyko, you know, the, the people who have very strong pro-Russian views, then that's going to cause serious problems for him. Last time I was here, Bogdan Nikhailo was in the studio as well at the same time. And Bogdan has long thought that, that potentially Yulia Timoshenko is, is uh, being lined up to be the coalition partner or potential prime minister or, or, or whatever other position she decides that she wants. But, you know, if, if you look at Yulia's... In, in recent days, they, they've just started this big, big board campaign. Right? We need actions, we need deeds. Like... Yulia, Yulia Tymoshenko has been around politics in Ukraine for 20 years. Now she's saying we need actions, we need deeds. Like, everyone forget, been doing everyone forget <laughs> the last 20 years, everyone forget, you know, the scandals that have come with her. I, I, for me, I mean, you, the, the, the one that you mentioned there uh, that I haven't yet mentioned, uh, Vakarchuk Skolas party, I mean... I, I've seen other polls as well. You said 6.6%. I, I think I saw something yesterday saying 8.1%. But um, I, I, think he's, I think he's likely to get into Parliament and uh, he's certain to get into Parliament pretty much. Um, but, but one of the interesting things about his campaign, and I've, I've watched it quite closely, do you know what he hasn't done? Is he hasn't gone on the attack to anyone. And Ukrainian politics is a dirty, dirty business. It's full of black PR. Slava hasn't gone in that direction at all. He's run a clean campaign. He's set out what he wants to do. He wants to change the mentality of the Bukovna Irada. Um, I... With 8%? How would you how would you explain as well this quite a low uh, results because when they went to the uh, went uh, started the campaign launched the campaign uh, they wanted to have at least fifteen percent because there would be too little people in the parliament. Look, uh, that's an interesting question, but uh, it looks like they work with uh, Zelensky on the same electoral part of Ukraine. I mean. Uh, Golas wants to bring new faces, younger generations. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what uh, Sluga Naroda is doing, so uh, servant of the people, so the Zelensky party. And uh, if uh, you look at the substance of the messages, they're pro-European, definitely, so like Poroshenko. So uh, the question is, what the new message they bring compared to more savvy leaders or more experienced politicians. You have to create your own message, mm -hmm. your own kind of uh, uh, enigma that, 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 that differentiate goals from other forces. Uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, uh, who is the uh, 
close, let's say we can say a friend of Vladimir Putin and openly pro-Russian politicians gained a lot of weight within the last year. He has got his, his partners had bought already the third uh, TV channel in Ukraine. They are very strong in their business. Their business has grown a lot within the last year. And the political party, now more or less an overtaking party, uh, and the voices from other oligarchs like Akhmetov, uh, for instance, uh, there is another opposition party, uh, which has quite a few, just few percent, supported by uh, Renat Akhmetov. Uh, Donbass, former Donbass based, um, you know, uh, oligarch now based uh, outside of Donbass. So uh, a lot of people are speaking about kind of a revenge of the pro-Russian forces. But how can you explain also the effects of the Medvedchuk being so strong and his position? I, I think we only have to go back, you know, as far as within the last decade. In 2010, Yanukovych was was elected. <clears throat> and and the, the the vast majority of the voters who who put him in the presidency came from the east of the country, and so we're always going to have this natural leaning here in Ukraine. I mean, we're in Kiev, which is still by and large a Russian-speaking city, although more and more nowadays it's changing to Ukrainian. But but there's always going to be, as you and I were talking about with Professor Snyder and what he was saying, his comments last week, that there's always going to be that, that, that element of uh, support for Russia or feeling of strong ties to Russia amongst the Ukrainian electorate. It, 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 it's not a surprise that Medvedchuk is getting, or, or Yuri Boyko is getting that kind of number. That's a point. There is quite a difference. Maybe you would also explain this difference between Yuri Boyko and Viktor Medvedchuk. Uh, that's uh, a little bit surprising to me, because uh, if uh, uh, I don't see them that closely politically affiliated, but uh, probably they understand that uh, with each other, they they stronger uh, so they can get this uh, quite a, a number uh, and but if we, we remember the previous elections uh, that was almost the same so they stay we have to recognize probably we have like 10 11 percent in Ukraine who are like very strongly support them no matter what mm -hmm. uh, so the no question is what. no matter what, <laughs> yeah. no matter what. Did, regardless of their regardless, history regardless, regardless of yeah. their record yeah uh, so so probably they just uh, the difference is whether Medvedchuk is in or out but uh, let's again uh, let's remember the SDPU, SDPU united right i mean the party created by Medvedchuk is still in the center of Kyiv for how many years? And I for 20, and it's still there. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, he's, he's in politics for a long time. But uh, I also should mention that they traveled to Moscow, uh, Viktor, uh, Viktor Medvedchuk with um, Yuri Boyko as well, met again the uh, Russian Prime Minister Medvedev. Uh, so there is a new circumstances, there is this uh, new media uh, group growing. Uh, there are some former pictures uh, of the visit. There were quite a few of them. Uh, Medvedchuk recently had also been the main protagonist of the uh, movie done with the support of the Oliver Stone. Yeah. So um, do you see something new there? Of course, they're trying to change the image. They try to persuade people that uh, he can... As By the way, that is, if I uh, remember right, that was his words. We are not yet in the power but we already brought four people uh, from Russia, and uh, we are not yet in the power. We have already 25% discount. Of course, mm -hmm. this is complete nonsense, both. Uh, and this discount means nothing, uh, taking into account prices on the world market. And the, uh, this uh, kind of, uh, again, uh, they still probably, in, in Moscow, they still think we are that stupid to buy it for, for this 25% discount, mm -hmm. this complete nonsense. Uh, and uh, definitely we can buy gas even cheaper uh, if we do our job right. Uh, so this this nothing. And this uh, uh, definitely this is a shame to see uh, those two politicians uh, uh, going to Moscow to get like a blessing from Medvedev and Putin. I mean, in the current circumstances, this is really outrageous. But you can you can see the line of the messaging though, where it comes from. I mean, the the first question is, what do these people, what authority or right do these people have to go and sit with Medvedev and to negotiate any discount with him at all? Zero. But one of zero, zero nothing. Zero. Yeah. But one of the one of the hot button. Uh, uh, 
social topics rather than political topics, but it's turned into a political topic, is the price of utilities. And so the people who are watching Medvedchuk's TV channels are seeing we're going to get a 25% discount in our gas. Our, our gas bills are going down, right? That's, that's the logic. That's the way that they're trying to play this. And because the gas is too expensive, it is true. Mm -hmm. So the people think that that will be something substantial. But definitely it is not. I mean, it is not going to happen. So uh, the economy is definitely the most, one of the uh, key issues. Uh, I'd like you to discuss as well the economic policies of the probably the leading party servant of the people because now it's already the stage where we would like to look closely what exactly these guys are going to do. But before going for that, I suggest we also watch uh, the, uh, some parts of the um, interview we've done with Sergei Guriev, who is the leading economist of the European Bank of Reconstruction. Uh, what we in fact done, uh, we discussed the Servant of the People Zelensky Party uh, economic program. Sergei also had watched the series with the participation of uh, Viktor uh, Vladimir Zelensky, but as well uh, analyzed his meetings, uh, the meetings of his colleagues uh, with the current Ukrainian president. Without a doubt, this is an important step forward from the viewpoint of increasing Ukraine's competitiveness, increasing Ukrainians' income, increasing the productivity of agriculture and agribusiness. Undoubtedly, we welcome land reform, just like we welcomed it under the previous government. Privatization should be real, competitive and open. We see that in previous years Ukraine has come a long way, including in this area. Today, small state assets are sold through Prozoro, through an open and competitive system. We cannot say that it is impossible to conduct fair privatization in Ukraine. Today, there is much more confidence that Ukraine possesses the institutions, funds and resources in order to conduct this privatization fairly. Capital amnesty in itself may or may not work, depending on how the rest of the tax system is organized. At this moment, it seems to me that we are not ready to discuss this in detail. Indeed, not all international organizations regard this proposal as positive. In general, of course, we need to ensure that people are ready to pay taxes and do not have to fear tax inspectors. But this measure alone, without a combination of other reforms, cannot solve all of the problems. Responsible fiscal policy is always a part of the IMF program. You can reduce taxes if you can prove that this will lead to higher tax revenue revenues and not the opposite. There is no prohibition on lowering taxes as such. There is an aversion to populist promises that lead to a growth of the budget deficit. Fortunately, President Zelensky, in conversation with both the IMF and the president of the EBRD, Suma Chakrabarty, said that he will fulfill all obligations and in this respect, then, we heard what we wanted to hear. I don't think anyone has any personal relationship with Ihor Kolomoisky. This is really about Privat Bank. It was and remains one of the largest Ukrainian banks. If the largest bank of the country lacks capital, assets are invested in enterprises and projects affiliated with the main shareholder, this is a threat to the financial stability of the country. Banking systems cannot function if there is no capital in the largest bank. Therefore, nationalization was the correct choice. It seems to me that the word oligarch is key for Ukraine, Russia and some other countries. The main the problem of economic development hindering the creation of a market economy in such countries is that big businesses influence the rules of the game. The main question for President Zelensky, or his TV character President Holobrotsko, is how to protect state institutions from the influence of big businesses. This includes an independent central bank, independent regulatory agencies, parliament, media and courts. I saw their commitment to the idea that the prosperity is created by the private sector, and therefore the government need not interfere with the private sector. The job of the state is to ensure that the courts work efficiently and independently of the business. An important test is whether this party, the new government, will be able to carry out land reform. The Russian economy does suffer from sanctions. Any statements that the sanctions are only for the benefit of Russia are not true. If you look at the actions of the Russian authorities, they often try to ensure that the sanctions are lifted. It is very difficult to assess the quantitative effect of sanctions because de facto they reinforce the isolation of Russia, associated with a bad investment climate, with a higher level of corruption and state domination. Whether additional sanctions and restrictive measures can be imposed? Yes, of course. Moreover, it is the threat of such restrictive measures that is the main deterrent in the international politics. The United States have already passed certain laws. If there are any new political or geopolitical changes, and if these laws are enforced, it would cause additional damage to the Russian companies and the Russian population too.
So watch the full interview of Sergei Guriev, the senior economist of EBRD, uh, in a bit on our webpage en.hromatsky.ua. It would be also promoted on our social media, uh, Twitter, Hromatsky International, and Facebook, Hromatsky International. But uh, of course, a lot depends on the parliament. So we're looking at the snap elections results in a week. Uh, but some things had already been done uh, by the president. So how you read uh, their uh, actions, in particular on these issues like the economy, like the appointing the, the people, do you see any consist consistency in... Uh, an, uh... Uh, I do see the consistency, but I would like to see uh, more system, more, uh, more strategic uh, vision of what, where we are going. Mm -hmm. So first steps on, for example, on customs. They're extremely important. That he began to clean up the western border. Uh, he fired all the custom officials. Put the Max in charge, in charge yeah, of yeah. the custom. That's that's very important because it, it was an independent competition, as far as I understand. It, yeah. it, it was, but we, but we, still uh, it's cool. even more important that he is personally well trusted and he's yeah. honest yeah. and he will try. Uh, really to clean up and yeah. it's unimaginable amount of money we are losing billions of dollars only just because of this corruption on the on the customs so mm -hmm. that's important on the other hand whatever i mean grieve mm -hmm. said uh, many important things but they will leave us in details how you do privatization of land if you don't have even the proper counter uh, of land so we we need we need to counter every every piece of land to realize to who owns what uh, and defend that in the court to have a register, uh, uh, the central register, which would say, uh, and then we will see the market price. We have absolutely no idea about that. And each time you want land, it, it, it would turn out that five people already own it in different stages, and nobody knows who is owned what, and, the, and where is all the cases in the courts. So important to clean up the system. It, it, it is so dirty, it's unimaginable. So. The right ideas should be implemented in a very correct and systematic way. Mm -hmm. That's the question. Paul, uh, I remember prior to the present election, there were all those talks, and like, even after, like, do Zelensky has the uh, program? Uh, he has. Not, the servant of the people now has a program. We can read it. We just analyze it. No. So, you know, how it goes together with the actions to the extent it's doable and possible within this time, what have you mentioned? <laughs> Also, regarding the uh, connection to the oligarchs. It, it, is, it is the connection to the oligarchs that worries me most. And, and Guriev just, just said there that he doesn't think that Kolomoisky has any friends. Um, uh, no, I don't think particularly that Zelensky is a friend of Kolomoisky, but, but Kolomoisky is a person who, who engineers situations that he will then take every advantage of that he can. And the proximity, whatever the nature of the relationship between them is, but the proximity between Zelensky and Kolomoisky is very worrying. Now, um, when it comes to the platform, what proposals, policies he's, he's suggesting, there's not a lot wrong with what Servant of the People have come up with. And again, Gordiev did point out there that, that the tax reduction proposals could turn out to be hollow, could turn out to be populist, and could turn out to cost the, the, the country in the long yeah, run. Well, exercise some caution. <laughs> it, 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 caution is needed, and we'll, and we'll have to see how it comes out. But, but the, the thing that concerns me more, actually, really, with Zelensky in that scenario of having uh, a, a, a majority that he's able to form a government on his own, is that there's no, there's no set of checks and balances, right? And, and Ukraine needs checks and balances right now. This is a very precarious moment for the country. And I was reading, rather than talking about policy, let's talk about people. I was reading before I came out an analysis of the party list of the servant of the people. Um, it was a long article in the, in the Kiev Post, and it mentions there people high up on the list, I think 21st or 22nd on the list, is a person who has personal ties to Medvedchuk, who we were discussing earlier on. There are, there are I, I believe to be 40 people on the uh, Servant of the People Party list who are demonstrably tied to Kolomoisky in one way or another. And there were, I think that the figure that they found was uh, was 28 people in the list as well, um, who were going, I mean, they're fresh faces. They've never been Narodny Deputats. They've never been members of parliament. Um, but those 28 people are actually working currently for members of parliament. They're a part of the current system. So, you know, with, with that number, you know, 60 people out of a party list of 200, 
who are potentially questionable with ties to oligarchs or current politicians or people like that. I, I, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I would ask about your concerns. However, I would be uh, happy to mention, uh, not happy to mention, I think I, uh, it's also for us very important to, men, uh, to be very careful in Ukraine because sometimes it's like a wife of a wife of a wife was connected to a, a husband of a something. Yeah. For instance, like with this particular man, there was some kind of the, uh, a designer working for a wife or like working for... Uh, wife of Medvedchuk, who is a TV presenter. So sometimes not every clear connection is that very much clear connection because in Ukraine so many people are connected. So I probably would ask every Ukrainian and international expert to be very careful and be kind of 100% sure. Uh, but what also are your thoughts uh, if we, besides, you know, if you look at the party list and as well, when we're coming to other um, actions of the current president? Uh, what I think is very important that they look like, I mean, they're listening to Zelensky and to his team uh, about their statements. They're very business oriented. That's extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, if finally, finally, a business will brief easily, I mean, private business, small business, medium exercise, uh, enterprises, if SBU will be deprived of those pressure on businesses, that if uh, those unnecessary checks by whatever authority, uh, will be cleaned, I mean, and business will thrive, uh, probably that's extremely important. It's even more important than you're absolutely right. It's so easy in Ukraine to claim you, you, you once I saw you in a cafe and the, the table, just a table that was a very bad guy or, or, or somebody. I mean, this is not the case. I mean, you have to follow uh, policy. You have to see uh, the program. First, we need to see the composition of the government. Mm -hmm. That's key. Once we see composition of the government, and then media should like X-ray each of them to see their connection to businesses, private interest involved, mm -hmm. whether they have businesses at all. Because we, we can talk endlessly about the previous government, and we know all. There were a lot of business people inside, people very heavily dependent, I mean, if not to oligarchs connected, but definitely connected to Zillion Enterprises, etc., etc. So mm -hmm. uh, this is nothing new in our case. But those people, what, what I like, the first, those first, maybe they're a little bit naive. Uh, then president personally tried to resolve issues in the region when they come to Odessa or to Kherson or to, mm -hmm. and personally say, look, you have to do that or that. This is not, it, it's not going to work. I mean, it's very, it's populistic actually, mm -hmm. but maybe that create a kind of hope that finally, I mean, Prashenko knew about all this problem with customs. Yeah. What was the, I mean, why not to clean it? I mean, finally, if he would exercise that, his, all his energy on that, that would be victory. But for some reason, it was not done. That's it. This week also started with the uh, Ukraine um, EU summit, uh, which is like an annual event. But we've seen that there is a lot of credit given to uh, Mr. Zelensky now by, by the West, uh, kind of the, giving him a benefit of the doubt. That's kind of a common phrase that everybody says. But uh, we also had a chance to talk this week. I had a chance to talk to former uh, now, current minister for foreign affairs, Pavlo Klimkin, uh, current because it the the uh, the Verkhovna Rada Ukrainian Parliament denied to dismiss uh, for the second time <laughs> Pavlo Klimkin though he wanted so Ukraine and the president now already um, said that there is a candidate however it wasn't successful uh, but we had a chance to discuss also the uh, the views or with uh, with Mr Klimkin uh, the key points of his five years uh, in the government uh, and as well the key issues for the Ukrainian foreign policy. We met before the inauguration. It is the right of President Zelensky to build this communication and coordination. There is currently neither a strategy nor a system. I hope that after the parliamentary elections take place, they will appear. How? Don't ask me. I don't know. It won't be me who will be building it. I said long ago that I genuinely want to resign and do something different. It's very simple. First of all, I didn't have proposals, but I won't speak about them. I was negotiating with Sviatoslav Akhachuk, but I could not find a team that I trusted completely and that would meet my expectations. Secondly, I believe that the time has come to create a party that is not leader-oriented. There have been examples in the past, we're not considering the Communist Party, but there was People's Movement, 
Every project I see now is purely leader-oriented. With this type of old politics, nothing will change in Ukraine. That's why I say that I want to be with friends that share my beliefs. Gradually, I will build such a team. I wish good luck to European solidarity, even though they have appointed themselves to defend both the EU and NATO. That is their choice, what their position is, what their politics are, why they are in politics and so on. Two things, domestic and international. One concerns Ukraine and one concerns Donbass. First, not to go back to the Russian zone of influence and not to fall under Russian management. Now the Kremlin is trying to explain to Europe, let's come to an agreement, we will keep the stability and we are willing to coordinate with you. Second, not to let the Kremlin launch the process of fragmentation in Ukraine. In this regard, in Donbass, we will need to give in on some difficult compromises. But this does not mean that the process of federalization and fragmentation should begin in Ukraine, which is what Moscow dreams about. The rest can be discussed. From the standpoint of his knowledge and experience, this is a person who knows a lot and has gone through many negotiations. I think he has become very cynical, or he allowed himself to become very cynical. This is a question for him, in fact. Communication mainly took place in the Normandy format. It was only on two occasions that we met one-on-one -on -one in recent years. Two issues were discussed at those meetings. The release of political prisoners and the Donbass and Crimea. Nothing else was discussed. Regarding Donbass, it was a possible format for a peacekeeping mission. On Crimea, what they were doing there, as well as the question of access for international organizations, including humanitarian ones. I believe there was by definition no meddling on our part. I spoke to Yuri Lysenko afterwards. He told me that it was his position, he did not coordinate it with anyone. It was his personal initiative to give this interview. I was sad. But above all, you are right, it was a fantastic phew. But this is the insanity of internal communication. Nothing bad happened in terms of attitudes towards me and towards diplomacy. They understand that we spoke sincerely, but the internal organization of our system is of course in a very sad state. I honestly told our partners how it all happened. Such things actually knock trust very quickly. It was real damage. The law was changed in the parliament hall. By the way, some of our Hungarian colleagues still believe that it was a deliberate provocation against Hungary, since the law was previously approved with entirely different formulations. As a result, it came as a surprise, and everything that started afterwards is a question of our very complex dialogue with Hungary. I have been to Zakarpattia on numerous occasions. I can say that if we had done something for Zakarpattia over these years, the situation would have turned out differently. If we had changed the teaching methods in Ukraine, the situation would have been completely different. If we had enough textbooks and manuals, the situation would have been different too. If we had given incentives to schools where there are both Ukrainian and Hungarian children, the situation would have been different. Therefore, this is a systematic problem and we need to solve it systematically. In reality, Ukraine should be more present in Zakarpattia. There is little Ukraine there, but a lot of smuggling. So, um, what are the main challenges at this moment for the President Zelensky without having the, uh, really the foreign minister so far, because there is no real uh, cooperation uh, between the MFA and the uh, President uh, at this stage? Uh, what are the, the most important things to watch and how do you also analyze uh, and assess uh, the, uh, the, the way the Zelensky does, the foreign policy being a novice? Uh, it's extremely, extremely difficult, if it's uh, possible at all, for president to operate without parliament and the government. It's not just foreign minister. He, he actually, he doesn't have a, a function in government. So, and that's in time when we cannot uh, wait until our partners will see the formation of the government. So, and you see so many already he began already visiting major capitals, and uh, it looks like uh, there, uh, there will be a visit to the United States. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, professionally, uh, I, would, I would strongly advise not to go without very, very proper preparation of, this, of such a visit. Uh, President Trump not in a position to invite Ukrainian president every year. So once you go to the United States, you have to be very well prepared with your own vision, because that will be the question. What you want? What you, Ukraine, want? What is your plan? How we can help you? So uh, that's, you know, uh, I remember that's, that's endless story when our partners say, help us to help you. You have to tell us what you want. So President Zelensky must answer this question in a manner that will be uh, uh, they would listen and, and really do something. And that's a challenge. That's a challenge. 
How do you now assess the relations uh, the, 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 on the, uh, with the foreign partners and where we are looking at? You know, the benefit of the doubt has some time limit as well. Uh, yeah, and, and, and it has a very short fuse on it too. Um, I, I think the, the first thing actually that I want to say is, is just a note of great respect to Minister Klimkin. He, he has done, like, in the most... I mean, you work closely with him in the most difficult of circumstances, in a time of war when they've needed to be at the MFA at three o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning. Like they, they it, Minister Klimkin has, has, has run an excellent, an excellent team. Um, how, how do I see the foreign relations? Um, it, it's difficult to know from day to day what's going on with the Trump administration. I, I get what you're saying, Sergei, that if Zelensky goes to Washington, D.C., that he must be very, very prepared. He must have his message. He must know up front what he wants to get out of the meeting. But I, 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 with, with Trump, it really depends. His, his opinion right now depends on who he spoke to five minutes ago. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's a difficult one. You, you, and, th and that situation is the same for everybody. Nobody knows how to deal with the Trump administration. But, but, but our neighbours, our closest and strongest friends are the European Union, currently the 28 members, and hopefully it remains 28 members of the European Union. And, and I see uh, messaging that, that is just is continued support, not just uh, giving the new administration the benefit of the doubt, but a, a continuation of the policy of supporting... Ukraine, because because U Ukraine deserves that support. It, it it deserves that support for being a, a, a victim of unprovoked aggression. It deserves that support for uh, for what we went through five years ago to make the change that this country needed when we stood on Maidan for ninety three days. But but Ukraine deserves that support as well because because we are on the border of the EU, and Ukraine just became the second largest exporter of agricultural goods to the EU. The, the, the rise year on year was 14%. And, and so Ukraine, as it continues to develop and to grow, and now we make more things that are of European quality as well, as the export figure that I just gave you testifies, right? As we make more things to a European standard, a European quality, we become more of a European country, and that is in the EU's interest. It's also in the EU's interest as well to help Ukraine to, to build that image of a European country, because it's a part of the soft power that we're looking at. I wrote something actually about the elections just a couple of days ago. One of the best things that Ukrainian people can do is get out there and vote. I'm not going to tell anyone who they should vote for, but get out there and vote, because a high... Uh, turnout at the elections is one of the greatest displays of real, you know, democracy is alive and well in Ukraine and Slav Ukraini. And by the way, in Europe, this is not the case. I mean, <laughs> numbers yeah. are quite low. <laughs> yeah. And I should say yes, because we also have to have a, uh, well, my colleagues all over the country have to do the tremendous job because we have 3,000 candidates of the MPs also on the uh, constituency, on their constituencies, so uh, that will take some time to come Mm -hmm. uh, so I encourage you to watch Hermansk International next Sunday. There would be discussion not at this time, not at 7 p.m. because that's exit polls. because <laughs> we we are not really allowed, and we had another uh, you, you know like to discuss to have a discussion in that time. Uh, but we still would be online for you. We are there 24/7 uh, for you on social media. I also encourage you to sign up for our weekly newsletter. No spam, just the most important stories. I'd like to thank uh, Serhii Korsunsky who is a Ukrainian um, diplomat and the director of the Ukrainian Diplomatic Academy, and Paul Nyland, who is a founder of Lifeline Ukraine. But before we finish and I say goodbye, I also would like to ask you another short interview. You would like you, you would be able to watch the full version. Uh, our interview with the Dutch ambassador to Ukraine. Uh, therefore, this Wednesday, it would be already five years since the downing of the MH17 jet, the tragedy which has taken life of 298 people. Uh, there, is, there are some results of the investigation. There are four people who are now uh, charged. They are named uh, among them kind of a well-known Russian uh, fighters. So uh, these are the. For, for, I'm saying you goodbye now, but uh, please watch also some uh, new, uh, some of the stories on the, the development of this uh, tragic uh, investigation.
criminal investigation will continue. Uh, we have excellent uh, cooperation with the Ukrainian authorities, with the Prokuratura here in Kiev, and um, we suspect that there will be more um, uh, people to be identified who are linked to this uh, tragedy in the later stage. Um, at the same time, uh, as a parallel track, we have the uh, state complaint, uh, which was uh, deposited by the Netherlands government in cooperation with the Australian government against Russia on the basis of the proof that the buck was transported from Russian territory uh, into Ukrainian territory. Um, so we hold Russia accountable for this. And on the basis of these consultations, trilateral consultations between Australia, the Netherlands, and Russia have started um, uh, in Vienna. And these consultations uh, will continue. So on the basis of, um, of this proof, we have this so-called parallel track of the state complaints. We have the criminal investigation that will continue, and we have the consultations separately. Uh, and what is expected from Russia? What does it mean, a cooperation? Because, and what would be the sign that something is moving? What are the first like, yes. real demands? Well, when our minister was uh, visiting Moscow in April last year, he made very clear to uh, his uh, colleague, uh, Minister Lavrov, that we expect from Russia to comply with the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2166, in which uh, also Russia, by the way, um, committed itself to uh, cooperate with this investigation, with the criminal investigation. So we once again made clear to Russia that we expect them to comply with this resolution, this UN resolution. At the same time, we expect from Russia that they will stop discrediting the results of the uh, joint investigation team. And we expect them also to cooperate with the legal requests which we have put forward to them. Uh, the joint investigation team up to now has concluded that the cooperation from Russia is not sufficient. So uh, in um, international fora, like for instance uh, uh, within the framework of the European Union, but also in New York, in the United Nations, in Vienna at the OECE, we also make clear that we um, uh, think it's important that Russia will abide by this uh, resolution 2166. So we keep on pressing Russia to cooperate. He has a, a serious emotional impact in our society. And like yourself and like the people in Ukraine, also in the Netherlands, uh, we are monitoring very closely uh, what is going on because everybody uh, wants to bring the perpetrators to justice, to, uh, to the judge, and to make sure that um, they will be perpetrated. Uh, now the issue is um, uh, what can the Netherlands do more than uh, this criminal investigation. Uh, we have, as you know, the Trias Politica. We have the uh, general prosecutor who is independent and who can then uh, uh, continue his investigation according to his own rules and his own norms. Um, uh, the government, in principle, uh, is acting independently from the general prosecutor. Uh, but the government is, uh, as you know, as I indicated, um, following this uh, process in Vienna of the consultations on the state complaint.